This morning's scripture reading will be taken from James, chapter 3, verses 13 through 18. James 3, 13 through 18. Who among you is wise and understanding? Let him show by his good behavior his deeds in the gentleness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, do not be arrogant and so lie against the truth. This wisdom is not with, is not that which comes down from above, but is earthly, natural, dominic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there is disorder in every evil thing. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, reasonable, full of mercy and good fruits, unwavering, without hypocrisy. And the seed whose fruit is righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Good morning. What a beautiful day to come out to worship our Lord and our God. I wish the fathers of the congregation happy Father's Day. One in particular for me, happy Father's Day. We are certainly blessed with a lot of good, faithful men in this congregation. We certainly appreciate the work that you do for your families and for the congregation here. Obviously, you consider what our Father in Heaven has done for us. And it's truly awesome. It's amazing. I appreciate thinking about or anything that makes what Jesus did for us real. That noise of a hammer hitting the wood and a nail going into the flesh. For me and for you, we can read it it helps sometimes to hear it, but we need to make it real, to understand truly what he was willing to do for us. I want to talk about him a little bit this morning. We're going to talk over the next few weeks, Tyler will be preaching some of them, about our Savior and the fact that we need to be like him and what it looks like to be like him as we draw near to God and understanding what it means to be a child of the living God. Last week in the evening, I talked about the tongue. And the dangers that come with the tongue. Our speech, we're going to look at the rest of that chapter in just a minute. But it's interesting to me what it really means to be a child of God. We're going to start in Colossians, the third chapter and the fourth chapter. I want you to notice what is said about God's people in Colossians, the third chapter and the fourth chapter. What is supposed to be of us. What we are to be doing as God's children, and then making sure we're actually doing this and focusing on this. Our Savior came to die, not solely to give us the opportunity to be with Him for eternity. We are part of His family. We have the opportunity to be a child of God. What an amazing thing that is to say. But the interesting thing is how this is worded in Colossians, the third chapter. Beginning in verse 1, he says, Therefore you have been raised with Christ, keeping the things which are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on the things that are above, not on the things that are on the earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. What a beautiful passage that is. And as I've said many times, can you imagine if it was true for all of us? Jesus Christ is my life. I set my mind on things above, not on things that are on the earth. Verse 2 steps on toes a lot. Do I set my mind on things above, or do I focus so much on the things of this earth? He is my life. He was the one that was willing to die for me, and I have died, and my life is hidden in him. He goes on here and gives a big therefore in verse 5. 
5 through 11. Therefore, if you're a child of God, if he's your life, this is what you're going to be willing to give up. Treat the parts of your earthly body as dead to sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which amounts to idolatry. For it is because of these things that the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience. And in them you also once walked when you were living in them, but now you also rid yourselves of all of them, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene speech from your mouth. Do not lie to one another since you stripped off the old self with its evil practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created it. A renewal in which there is no distinction between Greek and Jew and, circ and circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, Slave and free, but Christ is all and end all. Can you imagine if we actually gave those things up? He's my life. Okay, if he's your life, do you struggle with these things? Not that you're not going to be tempted by things, but are you actually living for these things? The things that are mentioned in verse 5. What about verse 8? You get caught up in anger and malice and all sorts of language. Verse 9, lie to one another. See, the danger a lot of times is that we try to say in verse 4 that he is my life. I'm living for him. But actually, verses 5 through 11 may describe us a little bit more sometimes. That's the danger. The understanding of what it truly means to be like Christ. He goes on here in this chapter, and he talks about these things that we are to do in verse 12. So as those who have been chosen of God... Holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another, forgiving each other. Whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so must you do also. In addition to all these things, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. Let the peace of Christ, to, to which you were indeed called in one body, roll in your hearts and be thankful. Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you, with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Singing with thankfulness in your heart to God, whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. Do we put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility? All these things mentioned. Be like Christ. Do we see Christ in our homes? He talks about wives, husbands, and children, fathers. Do we show Jesus Christ to our family? Do we handle situations as he goes on here? As Jesus would. Verse 23, whatever you do, do your work heartily as for the Lord and not for people, knowing that this it is from him, from the Lord, that you will receive the reward of the inheritance. It is the Lord Christ whom you serve. Is he the one that we are striving to be like? And then you get to this interesting part in chapter 4. And hopefully you understand I'm just laying this out as a foundation as we get into this. He says, devote yourselves to prayer, keeping alert in it with an attitude of thanksgiving, praying at the same time for us as well that God will open up us, us a door for the word so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I have also been in prison, that I may make it clear in a way that I ought to proclaim it. Conduct yourself with wisdom towards outsiders, making the most of the opportunity. Your speech must always be with grace as those seasoned with salt so that you will know how you should respond to each person. How we speak to God in our prayers and how we speak to others. Let me ask you the question. How often does our speech to God and our speech to other people sound vastly different? We talked about last week the idea that we can bless God with the same mouth that we curse man who made it in his image. How often does that happen, though? How amazing it is to read the things that we were talking about this morning, about what our Savior is supposed to be and what we really want to be, I would love to be full of compassion and kindness. That sounds great. But then when a moment comes where I need to show compassion, I'll pray later and ask for forgiveness, I guess. Or kindness. Instead of making myself or working to reach the point where I can actually show that in all situations. Striving to be compassionate to people. But when it comes to our wisdom and the things that we do on a daily basis, and what this looks like on a day-to-day -day basis when you're dealing with people that, quite frankly, you just don't get along with, 
We read verse uh, 13 of chapter 3 where he says, Whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so must you do also. It's easy for me to show compassion and kindness to people that I don't have an issue with or that are kind to me. He tells me if, somebody, if I have a complaint against somebody else, I need to be willing to forgive. The attitude of our Savior, His willingness to die for you and for me to give us the opportunity. So last week, we talked about the way that we speak to one another. I want you to think about this morning, about this wisdom that he goes on and he talks about here. Because when we talk about this, we can have Bible verses that come to our minds, but what when somebody comes up to you and asks for advice? Is it human wisdom that you give them or godly wisdom that you give them? Is it human wisdom or is it godly wisdom? James, the third chapter, the, the verses that were just read to us, compares human wisdom, which is caught up with bitter jealousy, as verse 14 talks about, selfish ambition in your heart. Do not be arrogant and so lie against the truth. This wisdom is not from, which comes from above, but is earthly, natural, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there is disorder in every little thing. Does that describe the advice we give people? Or, when it comes to wisdom, in verse 17, but the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, peace-loving, gentle, reasonable, full of mercy, and good fruits, impartial, free of hypocrisy. Or does that describe it? What advice do you give to people? And how do we accept this advice? We need to be willing to give people advice. There are things that people are going to ask. You need to be able to help them. But we also need to understand as we give advice and accept advice, advice, it's not gospel. There are things that I've talked about in 20 years that I'm pretty sure I would give different advice now than I did 20 years ago to people. It comes with experience and hopefully wisdom. And so it changes. So how I give advice, am I putting it through the prism of what would Jesus do? Through the gospel, through God's word. Or is it many times just how I would handle a situation? I'm going to tell you as we get into this. A lot of times the way that I would handle a situation says more about the advice that I'm giving to somebody else about me than it does about the situation or them. This is how I would handle the situation. What a dangerous thing that is. Doesn't mean it's not going to be grounded upon the truth. But we certainly need to be careful and let's make sure it's not caught up with selfish ambition or jealousy. Let me ask you this. For Joseph in the Old Testament, what advice would you have given him about his brothers? What advice would you give him? Joseph, powerful man, could have done anything he wanted to his brothers. Has a little fun with his brothers. What advice would you have given him? I'll tell you what I would have told him. Take care of your dad, kill your brothers. There's no way in the world that I could live in a house with my brothers if they would have done that to me. Isn't that what we tell people? If you're having marriage issues, there's no way I could get through that. What kind of advice is that? We need to understand that when it comes to God's word and how we tell people things or what we explain to people, it's so important that it's grounded upon God's word. Joseph, thankfully, in that situation, had the right attitude. This is from God. You meant evil, but this is about God. You think about that situation. If Joseph would have killed his brothers, what do you think that would have done to his dad? You see, we give advice sometimes based off solely of what we would do in a situation, and there's never any thought of the responsibility anywhere else that happens. There's repercussions to the things that we decide to do and how we handle things. And there's importance with the words that come out of your mouth and power that comes with them. And people are going to listen to that advice. What would you tell old Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego? I mean, they were just going to do whatever Daniel did. They were goody goodies, I guess. They weren't going to bow for anything. But old Shadrach, what if you had the opportunity to say something to him? Shadrach, what's the big deal? Just bow down and move on. Just move on. You bow down. You don't have to think anything. Just bow down. And you move on. 
What great advice that would be. Advice that we would give people today. And you know the amazing thing about that advice? It's wrong. It's sin. There's no doubt in my mind that there were other Israelite young men at that time that had to battle this very same thing. I'm, I'm just going to bow and move on. What's the big deal? I'm just, I'm just going to do it. I'll stay under the radar. Nothing's going to happen. I'm not going to end up in a fire. What advice would you give them? Thankfully for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they were going to stand on their faith. What advice would you give Joseph about his pregnant wife? You see, the danger so often is we know the rest of the story in the scripture. So obviously I would never tell Shadrach to do anything differently. I would never tell Joseph to do something differently. And yet that's what we do here in our day-to-day -day lives or potentially can do. The whole purpose of this is that, yes, we can talk about how powerful the tongue is, and it is. But when you make real application to the things that we've told other people, when you think about the advice that you give and whether or not it's based on human wisdom or whether it's based on godly wisdom, it steps on my toes quickly. And I know I'm not alone in that. We need to understand the things that you tell people to do are being listened to. They may be followed, but it's not because it's in God's word or it's to bring glory to God or for any good reason. It's because you told them. We see that in the Old Testament. Rehoboam, not willing to listen to the wise, what does he do? He listens to his, his fellows, the guys around him, people same age. Just do this. And he, he listens to them. We've got to be careful on various fronts, who we ask for advice, the advice that we give, and how we accept that advice, making sure that we understand the bigger picture, that we are to glorify God in all things. You know, it's interesting to me when you think about Jesus and how he handles situations. Luke, the seventh chapter, Jesus is talking, he's talking about the Pharisees, and he uses the phrase that they were going to be calling him, he was a friend of sinners. You're a friend of sinners, Jesus. What a horrible thing that is to say. You're a friend of sinners. So I want you to think about that as we go through this. In Luke, the fifth chapter, our Savior calls this man that I'm not 100% sure that I would have talked to. There's a guy by the name of Levi, Matthew, as we normally call him. He was a tax collector. Now, we talked about this before. In the scriptures, it's amazing to me, it'll say sinners and tax collectors. They have their own group right they're worse than sinners so jesus sees him in this tax office and we've talked about again this how amazing this had to have been levi i have a feeling just didn't have people that came up and just had small talk with him i'm going to guess and if he did there was a lot of yelling involved but jesus comes up to him and says follow me and he says he got up and left everything behind and and got up and began following him. In verse 29, And Levi gave a big reception for him in his house. And there was a large crowd of tax collectors and other people who were reclining at the table with him. And the Pharisees and their scribes began grumbling to his disciples, Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Why would you ever do that? Why would you waste your time talking to people that you know are caught up in drugs? or alcohol, or pornography, or horrible things of this life? Why would you waste your time talking to them? Why would you ever spend time with sinners? Our Savior says, it is not those who are healthy who need a physician, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous to repentance, but sinners. Now, the Pharisees didn't understand he was talking about them also. But, way too often, we're the Pharisees. Why would I ever talk to somebody about the truth when I know, when I know they'll never listen to it? They're caught up with such horrible things in their life. Why would I ever talk to them? Think about Luke, the 19th chapter, this guy by the name of Zacchaeus. He wanted to see Jesus, of course. Which is an amazing part of this story, but what I love about this story is what Jesus says to them. 
See, the crowd and the people here were not too happy with what Jesus does. In verse 5, it says, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for today I must stay at your house. Verse 6, and he hurried and came down and received him joyfully. When the people saw this, they all began to complain, saying, He has gone into the, to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. Would we be like Jesus or the crowd? He's a sinner. Why would you ever go and be at his house? Why would you ever spend time talking to him? Why would you ever waste your time? People that are in situations where they're marriage, they're married to somebody who is not a Christian, why would you ever waste your time trying to talk to them? Because you can save their soul. Why would you not? And the danger of the advice that we give in those situations. Our God was willing to die for the worst of the worst tax collector, the worst sinner, and for you and for me. In verse 8, Zacchaeus hears the people that are talking, and he stops, and he says to the Lord, Behold, Lord, half of my possession is giving to the poor, and if I have extorted anything from anyone, I am giving back four times as much. And you know what Jesus focuses on? Today salvation has come to this house because he too is the son of Abraham. I love that. Because you know what the people would have thought? That is not the son of Abraham. He is not worthy to be called the son of Abraham. And there are times in our lives... Now, you may think about people. You may see them in the news. They are not worthy to be a child of God. And I'm telling you, Jesus Christ died for them. He died for them. Human wisdom, godly wisdom. Let me go back to Luke 15. When we talk about our Savior... Luke 15 is so powerful to me. Prodigal son, all the different things. But I just want to look at the first couple of verses here. Now, all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near Jesus to listen to him. And both the Pharisees and the scribes began to complain, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. What a horrible thing. They're complaining about Jesus. The tax collectors and the sinners want to listen to what he has to say. Why would they ever do that? Because he has shown interest in them. He has something special for them. They also have the opportunity to be a part of his family. He goes on and he tells these stories about things that are missing. And he ends with the prodigal son. And these two sons... One that's gone far off and the other one that didn't go any farther than the front door. He's still at home. But both hearts are wrong. One comes to his senses and comes back. The other one gets jealous and envious and angry and all the things we talked about human wisdom to begin with because of what his dad, his father was doing for the son that came back. We notice the son that came back because as God's children, we are the prodigal. We left. Hopefully, we've come back. The danger to me sometimes is that I'm the other son. I'm the one that's been here working, doing everything. And then looking out and seeing how others are treated, others are taken care of, whatever the case may be, and becoming envious or jealous or why should that guy get the same salvation that I get I've used my grandparents before my, my grandfathers one was an elder as you know at Lachlan for many many years the other one 
I'm not sure that he ever went to church to worship God except for the day he obeyed the gospel. Both of them, I believe, are with my Father in heaven. Are going to be. They're certainly in paradise. It's not about how long we've done something or how we view ourselves and how amazing we are. This is all about our God and His grace and serving Him. That's what our Savior shows us. There are people that you are talking to that need to hear the truth. There are people that you're not talking to that need to hear the truth. And it's not my truth. It's God's truth. We talked about in class. It's His truth. And we need to make sure that that's the truth that we are teaching, instructing, sharing to other people. Our Savior, we could spend the rest of the time, obviously, until He returns talking about what we can do to be like Him. But there are real changes that we need to make when it comes to the things that we say to people, how we talk to people, the advice that we give being founded upon the truth with good, godly principles. Not based on how I would handle a situation per se. But how would Jesus Christ handle this situation? And therefore, as a child of God, how should we handle this situation? We need to be kind, generous, courageous, being together. We're going to talk about all those things going forward. But ultimately what it means, you need to be like Jesus. Have compassion for other people. Show kindness to others. But never forget, our Savior died for everyone who has ever taken a breath on this earth. Every single human. Just to give them the opportunity. And just like we saw in Colossians, the, the fourth chapter, as Paul is telling them, please make sure that you're praying for us. That we understand that there are opportunities that are in our lives. And we have the opportunity to share Jesus Christ with them. I'm afraid so often what we do is just complain and get angry and miss those opportunities to introduce somebody to Jesus. Make sure you're looking for them. Make sure you're focused on the things that are from above, not on earth. If you do not have a relationship with him, I strongly encourage you to do so. It is amazing to consider the life of a child of God. The grace, the mercy, the love, the peace that comes with being his child. And obviously the opportunity that we have to be with him for eternity. If you have not obeyed the gospel, now's the time. He died for you. Just to simply give you the choice. If you've done those things and you just haven't been living the life that you should, he's long-suffering. He's given us the opportunity now to get our lives right with him. Make sure that you're always praying for one another, encouraging one another, helping one another. There's no reason to leave here not being right with him. There's no reason to leave here if you have questions. If there's anything that we can